um, to part two of movement. I'm going to finish talking about those units of movement. And then happily, I get into the brain, which uh, even though movement is not my background, uh, I'm much more a thinker, a cogitator, a, a sensor and a perceiver than I am a mover, apparently. But I am just so much more comfortable in the brain than I am in these kind of uh, talking about the muscles and the spinal cord. It's just uh, where I'm at. So we have these ballistic movements. Uh, most of our reflexes are ballistic movements, uh, which is a movement that's executed as a whole, uh, not corrected by feedback. When I've talked before about those psychotic eye movements, those are ballistic movements. And uh, you can think of them as a ballistic missile that once it, once it goes off, it's, um, it's just, it just goes to wherever we targeted it in the first place, uh, as opposed to uh, some kind of missile that can that can follow and, and find as uh, as I'm waving my hands back and forth now that that's not so ballistic. Many of our behaviors or movements consist of rapid sequences. So when we're writing, speaking, uh, dancing, they are these rapid sequences of movements. Some of these sequences depend on central pattern generators where um, we send the message from our brain to the spinal cord and then neural mechanisms in the spinal cord then generate this rhythmic pattern of um, motor output. Uh, I typically think of um, this, so sometimes if you have a more ballistic kind of way of typing, like I do, uh, and so when I write the word people or type the word people, I type it P-O-E, P-L-E. I'm not sure how that ever started, except that my right hand must be faster than my left. And now I'm very grateful that Word and PowerPoint and all these things automatically correct that because I would have to go back and correct it every time. And I can't seem to train myself out of it. I would It would take lots and lots of practice because again, I think it's just that my right hand is moving faster than my left. Uh, but you might notice uh, some of these same kinds of things that you f feel like you, once they kind of start, you don't really control them. And it's a whole pattern of um, a sequence of movements. And although a stimulus can activate a certain pattern generator, it does not control the frequency of the alternating movements. And I usually ask here for examples from the class and um, whether or not I handle, yes, that sounds like a central pattern generator or not. Uh, sometimes I have to say, hmm, uh, as to what uh, people's guesses are. Um, but you, so I think the example if it's not in your textbook, it's it's somewhere in one of these textbooks is of um, cats scratching themselves. So uh, once they go to scratch themselves, that frequency of movements, that is um, that that itch information and the fact that they're going to scratch gets sent down to this pattern generator. And that frequency of the alternating movements um, is just kind of it just goes. OK, and we can have a, we can have a motor program, which is a fixed sequence of of movements and um, we see this in um, um, mice when they do that when they do that cleaning of themselves that they do this uh, I can't remember the exact but lick 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 and then they pull their paws up and um, wipe wipe and then come back lick 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 wipe wipe and so this whole kind of motor program is is going and we see evolutionary influences on these motor programs I think your author uses the example of um, birds that don't use their wings to fly, but it's not that that it's not that far back in their evolutionary background that um, they will use their wings. So I think he say, I think he talks about dropping a chicken and that even though it's not going to fly, it's going to flap its wings. Whereas other birds, where that's farther back. The ancestry of, of the flying birds is farther back in their evolutionary background, so far back that they no longer um, use that that flight mechanism. So somebody apparently uh, dropped some something big like an ostrich. I can't remember if it was an ostrich or an emu, but dropped one of these bigger birds and they don't do that same kind of flapping. And Fritsch and Hitzig back in 1870 discovered that electrical stimulation of the primary motor cortex will elicit uh, certain movements. And usually this was just kind of a, a movement of um, an area of the body. 
the motor cortex is not sending those messages directly to the muscles. Okay, its its axons are extending to the to the brainstem and the spinal cord, which are then generating the impulses that control the muscles. So the cerebral cortex is involved in complex actions like talking and writing, or these really more voluntary, um, complicated motions. It's not involved for those really reflexive actions that are, are simpler like coughing and sneezing and laughing and crying. So some of those are coming from the, so I know coughing and, and things like that, sneezing are coming from the medulla. Okay, so here's our picture of the brain. And I'm gonna talk about a few of these regions that are being shown here in different colors. One is the primary motor cortex there in red. If you remember, it is just anterior to that central fissure or that central sulcus. And um, it has that same kind of body map, so the homunculus that we see in the somatosensory cortex. It's really similar, just slightly different in the motor cortex. And again, this makes a lot of sense for um, the fact that I want to feel my body and use that information quickly to um, for these kinds of reactions uh, to um, somatosensory information. But I'm also going to end up talking about the supplementary motor cortex, which is there in orange. I'm pretty sure I show this picture again every time I switch um, motor cortices. The premotor cortex, which is shown there in blue. I think I might even talk about Rocca's area, which is over there on the left-hand side and then a tiny bit about the prefrontal cortex and even a tiny bit about the information coming from the parietal lobes as we are making, as we have intentions to make certain movements. Then we're gonna start here with the primary motor cortex, that strip of motor cortex um, at the very posterior part of the frontal lobes. Uh, so, in the cerebral cortex, uh, the primary motor cortex was, we discovered, or Fritsch and Hitzig, Hitzig discovered that if they stimulate in the primary motor cortex that we see, it affects a certain part of the body. We can go and look at that homunculus, uh, which actually I, th I think that was still mapped up by Wilder Penfield, just like the somatosensory cortex was, is my memory. Um, I probably should go look that up, but that's, that's my memory of how that was mapped. Uh, so we figured out the the mapping of that. Um, but what they were doing was the short bursts of stimulation that were getting us to see, well, if I do that here in the um, left area where in the last slide we saw the thumb, then that's going to make the thumb twitch. But in 2002, Graziano, uh, Taylor, and Moore went in and they compared. Um, they went and looked at a, a monkey and they compared 50 millisecond stimulation time with 500 millisecond stimulation time, where now we're talking about a good half second of stimulating uh, some neuron in the brain. And what they found here was a complex pattern of movements. Okay, so I'm gonna use this one, the um, monkey up to the sort of the top left there, reaching to grasp. So somewhere in the, in the left primary motor cortex, now they're kind of near the hands, um, and near the uh, hands and fingers, we're gonna see this 500 milliseconds gets the monkey to uh, take its right hand and reach to a certain place and, and grasp. What they also found was that repeated stimulation to that same spot ended up in the same result. Okay, so if they're reaching up in the, this particular part of the right, right hand space, uh, that regardless of where the hand uh, starts from, the original hand position, the monkey moves the hand in the right way to move up to that part of space and to grasp. Okay, so the outcome, it's, we're not, the outcome is not specific muscle movements, it's a particular um, goal that is occurring or a particular outcome of um, where the move, where we want that movement to go. Okay, I'm going to move back to the posterior parietal cortex, which in this on this brain is being shown in the kind of purpley color. And so remember, we have our somatosensory cortex up there at the anterior part of the parietal lobes and our visual cortex in the back. And it's really, so what's happening if, as we go up through that where pathway, dorsally through the parietal lobes, we are um, aware, we're becoming aware of our 
body position, especially relative to the world and objects in space so that we, that we can navigate in the world, which is why this is sometimes called not a where pathway, but a how pathway. And um, in 2009, they did a study where they stimulated this posterior parietal region and what people reported after stimulation. So this was one where it was people who were getting ready for a surgery on the brain. And so they'll, they'll have the scalp uh, open and the, the brain exposed and they can go in and uh, talk to the people as we have, we don't have pain receptors in the brain and we can just, we can ask them questions. And so they would stimulate and the people would report that um, they had an intention to move uh, when we stimulated, stimulated this posterior parietal cortex. They stimulated that more intensely and the people reported actually having moved. Okay, they actually had not moved, but they, but the intention was so strong that it felt like they had moved. And uh, this region of the, there are, there is a part of this posterior parietal cortex that is called the parietal reach region. Because it's part of our um, intention to, and plans to, to reach. So I'm going to move forward in the frontal lobes here, and you can see the supplementary motor cortex being pointed to there in orange and the premotor cortex there in blue. I'm going to talk about each of those in turn. The supplementary motor cortex, both of those areas are active immediately before making a movement as part of that planning of the movement and um, uh, processing the movement to send that information to the primary motor cortex to then send to um, the area of the spinal cord or the um, brainstem. Uh, the supplementary motor cortex, sometimes referred to as SMA for supplementary motor area, it organizes rapid sequence of movements in a specific order. And it is involved with these internally guided movements. So I usually use this example of, uh, especially as I'm gonna go back and forth here between the two, but of, of right now my music, uh, music, my dance instructor is telling me to plie and then releve, and then I'm supposed to just go do that in this sort of internally guided way. I'm gonna go and, and plie and releve, that plan is being um, created there in my supplementary motor cortex, that sequence of movements. <clears throat> it also helps us to inhibit habits. So your author uses the example of a left turn. I'm gonna just go ahead and use my own example of the left turn on Bull Street. As I very normally go to the parking garage there, and <clears throat> so I make that left turn. But if instead of going to work today, I'm going up to the grocery store on Divine Street, I wanna go straight, I have to inhibit that habit of turning left and my supplementary motor cortex is gonna do that. If I space out and I'm forgetting and I actually do the turn left because I'm not really paying any attention to what I'm doing, that is the prefrontal cortex that's not paying attention. But it, if I was doing this appropriately, that would be the supplementary motor cortex that is inhibiting that habit. It's also involved with uh, error correction as when we make an error, it, um, it processes that so that we can not make that error in the future and then kind of inhibiting um, habits and errors <clears throat> when we need to. The premotor cortex is also active immediately before we make a movement. It is receiving information about the target, about body position, about posture, about all of these things that help that are going to help me direct my movement towards a particular target. That I have to be aware of all of those things to make the appropriate movement. And so, as this might sound, it's more dependent on externally guided movements. So, if I'm following my dance instructor and he or she uh, plies and releves and moves on and I'm supposed to go to the same spot and plie and releve and, and I'm following them, um, then I have a particular target and the premotor cortex is more involved in that sequence of movements. The prefrontal cortex there in green is also involved in our um, processing of movements and our plans to move. It is active during a delay before a movement as we are, as we in that working memory, we're storing that sensory information that is relevant for a particular movement that we wanna make. And uh, so sometimes they do this, um, having a monkey see something over to the right 
and then making that go away from their visual information so they have to remember that information before so that they can then decide to move over to the to the right uh, it considers the probable outcomes of possible movements and it helps us to inhibit movements as well as i already did this kind of the spacing out and not inhibiting that movement was really the prefrontal cortex that was not attending paying attention to um, what i wanted to do um, but I have a few examples. So one of my favorite examples is uh, my very first classes where I was teaching three classes at a time. And it was my first really morning classes instead of evening classes. And um, I had a really hard time that semester and especially making my coffee in the morning as apparently my prefrontal cortex hadn't yet woken up. And so I would make some stupid movement while <laughs> while making my coffee. And one time I remember being, I guess, so asleep at the level of the prefrontal cortex that I didn't put the carafe uh, back in the coffee maker. And so coffee was just spilling out all over the all over the counter. And I remember thinking, what's wrong with it today? <laughs> so not really realizing that, gee, duh, you need to put the carafe in because I was just that, that tired. And uh, my prefrontal cortex was not was not helping me out. Um, uh, but I have another example. What's my other example of the prefrontal? Oh, the prefrontal cortex is not active, as we'll soon talk about um, wake and sleep cycles, that we are moving in our dreams, but our prefrontal cortex is being inhibited. So we make these, we, we don't really consider the probable outcomes of our different movements in our dreams. And we do things that uh, seem very irrational uh, when that prefrontal cortex is um, turned off or inhibited. So I'm going to finish this up by talking about mirror neurons, and I'm not sure how much you've heard about them. I'm assuming that they are, I talk about them in several psychology classes, and they are a relatively new, new discovery. Either 1993 or 1996, Rizzolatti and colleagues were recording from the premotor cortices of monkeys, and they were looking at them performing a particular um, action. So picking up a peanut with their with their paws and um, at some point they were recording and the experimenter went to pick up the peanut and the neuron that they were were recording from was activated in the same way as if the monkey had picked up the peanut itself so these were neurons that were discovered in the premotor cortex that respond the same way whether you perform a specific action or whether you watch someone else perform that action. So when I'm going to grasp, grasp something, I have that um, uh, information coming from my premotor cortex to go and grasp that thing. And uh, when I watch you grasp something, some subset of those neurons are firing just as if I had grasped it myself. What these mirror neurons are for, I want you to think about through these next few slides. It's why I give uh, several different examples and why I talk about different um, studies, because it's really still a question. Uh, there are some mysteries about mirror neurons and why. Why do we, do we have these and what is this mirror neuron system doing for us? Uh, so I have my picture off to the right as one of the first parts of this question of showing the melts off and more kind of classic seminal study where they went up and made faces at infants and the infants would make the same face back so sticking out the tongue going doing the kind of awe face and then the squinchy kissy face uh, they appear to be imitating us whether that means the mirror we have a mirror neuron system that is helping us to imitate or whether we are developing that mirror neuron system uh, that is uh, we don't know at that point uh, they have also discovered audiovisual mirror neurons. So Rizzolatti and colleagues have done a study where, oh, I think it might be someone else now that I'm saying that out loud, have done a study where um, they have the monkey uh, crack a peanut and we see those neurons, we see these neurons fire. And then they uh, watch the experimenter crack the peanut and we see these neurons fire, some subset. And um, if they're watching and they don't hear anything, 
uh, they, it's not the same strength of firing, but we also see these neurons fire uh, when just hearing the peanut crack. And two, they've looked at um, musicians, piano players that, um, and, and non-musicians, so people who don't play the piano, as they're listening to a particular melody being played on the piano, we see uh, more mirror neuron firing in response in the musicians as, as if they are somewhat imagining that um, playing the piano, if you will. I'm not really sure, again, that it's an imagination sort of system, but um, how we're going to talk about this is, is uh, as how we end up talking about it. So I have a couple of links um, on this slide, and I'm going to have you start the next on Friday looking at the TED Talk by uh, Ramachandran. And so I'll work that into my mental when to uh, stop my recordings, how much time to make my recordings. The other one I'm not going to require, but I'll put it in the uh, into Blackboard. And it's not as good as it used to be. It used to be through PBS, and it was all one without any all one video without any breaks. And it was a good recording, but they've taken it off of PBS, and so someone made it available through YouTube. But the recording isn't as good, and it's chopped in half. So it's a, I like it a lot, even though they make some assumptions that are now a little outdated. But they are interesting assumptions to uh, to to watch. So if this is something you're really interested in, um, I'll put that one in there as well. Pierno et al. 2006. Uh, they talked about mirror neurons as an action observation system, and perhaps this has more to do with um, trying to figure out other people's intentions of, of action. And so they, they did a study where um, in the picture I saw it was a woman, but so this animated character is either, in this example, they, she was um, grabbing something that was over to the right. She looked over to the right as if she might go to grab it, or she just continued to look straight forward. And the neurons in the premotor cortex fired uh, in response to what appeared to be her intentions to grasp an object. So even if she just looked over at the object, like she might go to grasp it or do something with it, um, we see these uh, neurons fire. And so they called this an action observation system. And I'm going to, again, try to really strongly recommend that you think about what you think the mirror neuron system is doing for us. I'm going to end up breaking this in the middle, unfortunately, but I'm going to go through at least one more slide here of uh, different studies and what different researchers are assuming these mirror neurons, um, the kind of purpose of the mirror neuron system is. Uh, Denstein et al. in 2010 is just one of the groups of researchers that have found uh, normal mirror neuron system responses in autistic people and in schizophrenics. So I have heard several people talk about um, the broken mirror neuron system in autism. That is one of the things in that first um, YouTube video that I have that I'm, I'm not requiring. It's, it's kind of older, and he talks about this as if it's, this is what it, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, he's talking about it as if autistic people do not have a, a working mirror neuron system. But more and more research is suggesting that um, they have mir normal mirror neuron responses. I've heard of this about potentially schizophrenics. So people who are having difficulty with that kind of theory of mind and that ability to take the perspective and make some, some theories about what somebody else is thinking or doing. I've also uh, heard people talk about potentially de people with depression um, having broken mirror neuron systems, but we're not finding this in any of these um, groups. There's also a neat study by Katmer et al. in 2007 where they had uh, people watching someone and so they have their hands together and they move the index finger and um, the person's supposed to move their index finger. Okay, and then they had the person, uh, they're watching someone else move their index finger and in response to that, I'm supposed to move my pinky finger instead. Okay, so I'm having a, I'm having a different response and it means the movement of my pinky finger. And what they found was that the mirror neurons turned into what they called counter mirror neurons as those mirror neurons were uh, changing uh, in response to 
um, what my response to this person is going to be. So at least some of the mirror neurons developed their responses to, to learning that that person moving their index finger means my response is to move my pinky finger. So whether this is just figuring out other people's intentions or to some extent figuring out other people's intentions so that I know what my response is going to be uh, is another um, aspect or another way to um, think about that. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I am out of time. I'm just going to stop right there.